In a previous video, I showed a relatively simple way to produce another type of plasma for plasma culture that is not an electrical discharge using the corona effect. The plasma produced is a colder plasma that is safer for plants. In this video, I'm going to talk about another way plasma can be used to promote plant growth and health, namely plasma activated water. And in the second part of this video, I will talk about some other ways plasma activated water is produced and used. As mentioned in the previous video, I mainly use the plasma generated this way to experiment on cuttings. I have had some interesting results, but I should also be clear that some of my cuttings that were doing fine slowly started to show signs of stress after I exposed them to the plasma. This cutting completely died off, and this one is probably soon to be also on its way to the compost bin. I believe I overexposed those cuttings to the plasma. I treat all my plants like real people, so I'm very cautious about it. You take it and then a year goes by and everybody's fine. Then you say, okay, that's good. Now let's give it to uh, 500 people. And then a year goes by and everything's fine. You say, well, then now let's give it to thousands of people. And then you find out that it takes 12 years for all hell to break loose. And then what have you done? Yes, you took the words right out of my mouth. This guy knows what he's talking about. The failure with these two cuttings shows that exposure and overexposure to the plasma generated by my small low powered device did have an impact on the cuttings compared with the control group. While the plasma generated this way is safer for plant, if you look closely, you will notice that I'm not exposing the cutting directly to the plasma. I could have, but I did not. There is a thin water coating around the cutting as I had just taken it out from the water it was in. The reason I proceed this way is that the thin layer of water acts like a protection barrier that prevents the cuttings from being directly bombarded by the charged particles in the ionic wind. As this plasma hits the thin layer of water around the cuttings, it transforms the water into plasma activated water. There are different ways to produce plasma activated water. Usually, plasma activated water is produced by subjecting water to electrical discharges. This results in a soup of various active species, notably reactive oxygen species. You may wonder what reactive oxygen species are. Well, you surely know at least one reactive oxygen species. Ozone, which is made of three atoms of oxygen. Reactive means that the molecule can easily undergo chemical reactions with other particles and molecules around it. The reactivity of ozone is due to its unstable structure. Although the overall charge of ozone is neutral, the oxygen atoms of the molecule are supercharged with a high density of electrons. This high energy state drives the reactivity of ozone. Typically, when ozone is at a high altitude, it provides a barrier against radiations from the sun. Remember the scare about the hole in the ozone layer of the atmosphere in the 1980s? But at ground level, the reactivity of ozone in the air can have both good and bad effects on health. Ozone is only one of the reactive species produced by the EHD plasma generator. Other reactive species include electrons and ions. The EHD generator creates a charged ionic wind that carries this complex soup of particles towards the collector. The blast when the wind hits the thin layer of water around the cutting creates new reactive species, notably free radicals, including new reactive oxygen species in addition to ozone, and reactive nitrogen species as well. Many studies have been done on the effects of plasma-activated water on biological materials. I have already mentioned in a previous video about this study on cherry tree science, where cold plasma and plasma-treated solution were shown to improve grafting results. Here is another study on apple trees. This time, the researchers used plasma-activated water on apple trees planted in the field with foliage spraying. The team was surprised to find that foliage spraying with plasma-activated water had positive effect on yield, which they attributed to a decrease in fruit drop earlier in the growing season. But the most significant result was the increase in primary nutrients in the fruit, notably calcium, which may enhance fruit storability. There are many parameters involved in the production of plasma-activated water, like voltage, current, distance between the electrodes, etc. Even the water used can make a difference. For example, with tap water there is chlorine and probably other things that can interact with the plasma. Without the proper equipment to detect and quantify the reactive species produced, 
The approach I follow is to simply experiment and observe the results on the plants. What if you do not want to mess around with high voltage and cold plasma, but still want to practice plasma culture? In my opinion, the easiest way to get plasma activated water is to collect rainwater. Have you ever noticed how your garden becomes so much more alive after a thunderstorm? It's not an illusion. You can see the difference with watering from the tap water. Rainwater is actually plasma activated water from nature. Whenever I can, I water my garden with the rainwater I collect. And for my potted plants, I use only rainwater. In winter time, I store the rainwater in my garage. It's not clear how long the reactive oxygen and nitrogen species last in rainwater. For example, this study shows that there is a significant difference between storing plasma activated water at minus 80 degrees Celsius and at 25 degrees Celsius in terms of degradation of the reactive species contained in the water. Unfortunately, I cannot keep my garage at minus 80 degrees Celsius. So I try to renew the water in my rainwater barrels whenever I can during winter time. At the very least, my indoor potted plants do not get chlorine and other potential harmful stuff in the tap water. Another consideration is that the volume of water also helps maintain the room temperature and lower the electricity bill to heat the garage. Thank you for watching. Please do not forget to like and subscribe for more content like this. What? Still here? Okay, let me tell you a story. The raised desert dust had now become so thick that it appeared like a white mist and altogether obscured the view of the ground. It gradually rose higher and higher and after some time wrapped even the summit on which I and my 10 engineers was standing. Then a remarkable hissing noise was heard, which could not have been caused by the wind itself. One of the Arabs called my attention to the fact that by raising his outstretched finger above his head, a sharp singing sound arose, which ceased as soon as he lowered his hand. I found this confirmed when I myself raised a finger above my head. At the same time, I noticed a prickling sensation in my finger. That we had to do with an electrical phenomenon appeared from the circumstance that a slight electrical shock was felt when one tried to drink out of a wine bottle. By wrapping a piece of damp paper around it, I transformed such a filled bottle, having a metallically coated neck, into a laden jar, which was strongly charged when one held it high above one's head. It was then possible to obtain loud cracking sparks of about 1 cm range. This established in an unequivocal manner the electrical properties of the desert wind, which had been already before observed by travelers. I was standing just on the highest point of the pyramid, a large stone cube in the center of the flattened summit, when the sheikh of the tribe approached and communicated to me through our interpreter that the tribe had resolved we should immediately leave the pyramid. On being asked the reason, he replied that we manifestly practiced magic and that might endure the source of their livelihood, the pyramid. When I refused to comply with his request, he made the dash at my left hand while I held the right with the well-coated bottle in a manifestly conjuring attitude high above my head. I had waited for this moment and now lowered the neck of the bottle slowly towards his nose. When I touched it, I myself felt a strong concussion to judge from which the sheikh must have received a violent shock. He fell speechless to the ground, and several seconds elapsed, making me somewhat anxious, before with a sudden cry he raised himself and sprang howling down the steps of the pyramid with giant lips. Those words are Werner von Siemens' personal recollections of his visit on the 14th of April 1859 to the so-called Pyramid of Cheops, also known as the Pyramid of Khufu or the Great Pyramid of Giza in modern days. You surely have already heard his name. He was a famous German electrical engineer, inventor and industrialist who founded one of Germany's biggest conglomerates. Today, Siemens AG is the largest industrial manufacturing company in Europe and the global market leader in industrial automation and industrial software. It is interesting to note that various online resources indicate that Siemens experiment at the summit of the pyramid were not conclusive. One explanation could be that since his visit in 1859, the structure of the pyramid was changed. Another explanation could be that he was just a charlatan. I'll let you decide for yourself. But it does seem that some sort of giant corona effect happens around the pyramid. If so, 
Where is all this energy discharged? The evident answer will be in the air surrounding the pyramid, in which case the weather around the pyramid could be modified in some ways with plasma activated water which will precipitate as rain water and used for agriculture. Just like with our EHD plasma generator, in addition to the corona effect, there could be another effect that guides the plasma in a specific direction. Many esoteric illustrations of the Great Pyramid depict its summit projecting a beam of light towards the heavens. However, in 2018, a Russo-German team of researchers used commercially available simulation software to model the response of the Great Pyramid to external electromagnetic waves hitting it perpendicularly from its summit to its base. They found that the pyramid acts on the electromagnetic field in a specific manner. Most of the energy leaves the pyramid and focuses directly under its base, where the magnitude of the electric field is highest. Based on these results, some of the plasma created by the structure of the pyramid could be accumulating below its base, just like the collector in our EHD generator accumulates the charged particles produced by the emitter wire. What does all this have to do with plasma-activated water? A large aquifer is located below the pyramids, beneath the Giza Plateau. Actually, there is a whole deep and complex infrastructure built underneath the pyramids. The Osiris shaft is one element of this infrastructure. As the charged particles of the plasma interact with the aquifer, plasma-activated water is created. Some of the plasma-activated water can be collected or used right there, in the Osiris shaft below the pyramids, for example. What could be the properties of that plasma-activated water? And where does all the rest of the water go? This is the Osirian temple. It is always water filled by a source of pressurized water. James Westerman, an American archaeologist and researcher, tried to empty the temple of all the water, but never succeeded after multiple attempts. In 2012, even pumping at 500 gallons of water per minute, Westerman and his team were unable to dewater the Osirian. In 2008, the Egyptian Atomic Energy Authority performed isotope analysis of the water in the Osirian. The study showed that the water is different from the water in the wells around it. To this day, the source of pressurized water in the Osirian remains unknown. In 2022, an Egyptian team published this paper where they assessed that the Osirian water originates from not only the Nile River, but also from deeper aquifers. Their data also revealed a prospective origin in the direction of the north, rather than the south, where the Nile River flows from. Well, the pyramids of Giza are located about 500 kilometers north of the Osarian. The failed attempt of Western man to remove the water from the Osarian are reminiscent of the failed attempt by an Egyptian Egyptologist, Selim Hassan, after he discovered the Osiris shaft near the pyramids in 1933. Hassan found clear water at the bottom of the shaft and attempted to remove the water to access a submerged sarcophagus. He never succeeded. For the water to flow 500 kilometers underground from the Giza Plateau to the Osarian, in the opposite direction from the Nile River, there must be some unusual physical properties at play. Actually, many recent papers, like this one in 2023 from an American team, show that the physical properties of water change due to plasma activation with multiple potential industrial applications. As the plasma-activated water travels long distances deep underground, its physico-chemical properties further change. What are its properties when it emerges at the Osirian? There are reports that the water there is drinkable after filtering. Some people actually did just that, like Westerman. Some reported various health benefits, like improved eyesight. So, are the pyramids of Giza an ancient technology for plasma agriculture that also supplies enriched the plasma-activated water to various healing centers under the pyramids and in distant locations as well, like the Osarian, 500 kilometers away? And despite thousands of years, they are still functioning in some capacity? Well, that is not that more far-fetched than assuming they are power plants, gates to other dimensions and star systems, or even tombs of pharaohs. What's more important than food and health after all? But this is only the elucubration of a hobbyist gardener. Thank you for watching. Do not forget to like and subscribe for more content like this.